You get your Bibles out and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, we'll be in verse 6. And the sermon's titled, The Good Servant of Christ Jesus. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For a while, bodily training is of some value. Godliness is of value in every way as it takes hold of the promise of the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, and for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. And brothers, this is the word of the Lord. God, we come to you one more time and just pray, Lord, that your word would find its mark. And God, that you would, you would condition our hearts to have good soil, Lord, broken soil that can receive the seed, Lord, not, not rocky soil that, that springs up and quickly gets scorched, Lord, or thorny soil, God, that chokes out the seed. Lord, definitely not the seed that falls on the hard path, Lord. Let our hard hearts be broken. And Lord, I pray for those outside of Christ, they would be drawn to you. And for those in Christ, we would be conformed to your image sanctified, God, refined in fire and made like you so that we can be good and faithful workers and proclaimers of the gospel. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So while the Spirit-inspired and God-breathed words of Scripture here are written for the benefit of all true God-fearing pastors and men, this is a very also a very um, personal section of Scripture where where Paul gives very specific instruction to his son in the faith, Timothy. So this chapter goes from being very broad, like, it, like it's kind of uh, broad and, and, and sort of just vast in verses 1 through 5, to being very direct and personal. Paul is giving Timothy spiritual direction in the situation in which he finds himself. But he's also giving him a personal encouragement and also a warning for himself. He he kind of gives him an admonition and a warning at the end of this and says, make sure that you that you stay faithful in your own life, first and foremost, to the word of God in this gospel, and that you, you faithfully teach the word of, of the gospel of Christ, but also that you that you protect yourself so that you don't fall away and lead others away. Or or the way Paul phrases it, so that you might save yourself and those who hear. So often ministers judge or are judged by a criteria that has nothing to do with what actually pleases God. We often judge ministries and preachers, uh, their success based on what the world says success is. We do it by the wrong metrics. We judge success by church size or prosperity or social influence or how the world at large views us. This is really a very wicked way to view things. <coughs> the minister, just like the man of God, will be judged by God, but not based on perceived worldly success or ministry size or how many campuses you have or how many books you've written or how many followers you have on Instagram. God will judge ministers and pastors by the same criteria he will judge men of God. And that will be first and foremost, are you in Christ are you preaching the words of Christ and your character and your faithfulness? God does not judge us based on the criteria the world judges us. This is, this is aimed at pastors, but brothers, this is, this is straight for Christian believers too. 
Your success in life, as far as your spiritual success is concerned, isn't based on worldly achievement. What does the Bible say? Jesus himself said, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with making achievements or doing something that that prospers or is blessed. But thinking that that is the great indication of something is biblical and true and sound is very, very flawed. You can look out in the world and see that wicked men do prosper for a season in this life. And so the fact that a a ministry or a pastor has a lot of influence or a lot of uh, people at their church is not a good indication of whether or not they're faithful to God, whether or not they're people of character. You know, the real criteria is how faithful are they to the word of God? Are we preaching the whole counsel of God? When you leave this place, I don't care what denomination you go to. I don't care what kind of praise and worship they do. I don't care about the size of the church, if they have individual seats or pews, if it's an old white church house or some big metal building somewhere. The only thing I'm concerned about when you leave this place is that you find a church where the pastor thinks it's a weighty thing to preach the word of God and that the church is built around the pulpit. It says in this text, and in other places that the church should be built around the preaching and teaching of God's sacred word. Not ours. Not our word. Not my thoughts. John Owen, who was a Puritan writer and preacher, said this, A minister may fill his pews, his communion roll, and the mouth of the public. But what that minister is, on his knees in the secret place before God is what he is and no more. Who that man is in his prayer closet, who that man is in the dark of the secret place, who that, pre- listen, this isn't just for preachers, this goes for you too. Whoever you are, just when it's just you and God, that's who you are and no one else. There's no more to you than that. The face you put on in front of me, the face you put on in front of your parents, the way you act when you're at church, the way you act when the world is watching is not who you are. Who you are is what you do when no one sees but God. Because a man who fears the Lord is the same in both contexts. That's good, brother. That's good. Verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. So Paul is telling Timothy to be a good servant of Christ Jesus, that his focus must be on doing what God has commanded, not what the world says makes a good minister, but what God says, which Paul says is training brothers which have been entrusted to Timothy as the pastor with the words of faith and the good doctrine that he himself is living out. So we've seen earlier in this book that the first condition isn't how well you preach. To be a pastor, first and foremost, you have to be a person of character. A person who's not greedy for gain. A person who's the husband of one wife. A person who's honest. A person who's sacrificial. He's calling him a servant of Christ Jesus here. Now, we're all called to be servants of Christ, but shouldn't the person out front leading be the great example of what service is? And the greatest service the pastor gives the church is the preached word of God that lines up with a life of character that he's living. Paul tells him to be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Just a little something. When you read the Bible, you may notice sometimes that they call him Jesus Christ And sometimes it says Christ Jesus. The reason why typically, not always, but 99% of the time in the New Testament is to accentuate what they're talking about. Jesus Christ is, is typically on texts that are focusing on the humanity of Christ. And Christ Jesus is focusing on the divinity and the lordship of Christ. Christ is actually an office. It's not his last name. It's not Jesus Christ. Jesus, the word Christ literally means anointed one. It's the same uh, word as Messiah or Mashiach in Greek or in Hebrew. 
So the, the, the Jewish Mashiach, or the, the, the Greek word would be Christ, they both translate anointed one, and not an anointed one, the anointed one, the one who is the final prophet, the final priest, and the final king, the book of Hebrews tells us. Remember the pastor is merely a servant of Christ. And the joy of a servant is what? Of a good servant is to obey. This is the job of all servants of Christ. As a Christian pastor or leader of any kind, your job isn't to teach your wisdom or your insight, but merely to teach and lead people in what God has commanded. So when we break down what he's telling them to do here, he says, the words of the faith. And this is referring to the gospel that saves us. Anytime we talk about the faith, we are talking about the gospel. Or as Jude says, the faith given once and for all to the saints. There is only one, the faith. The word faith is, is irrevocably tied to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you use the word faith in a way it can't be reconciled to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and in biblical context, you're using it wrong. Faith isn't really, really, really wanting something. Faith is knowing we stand justified before God on the basis of Christ and that God will keep the promises he's made to us in his word. And the main promise of the faith is all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That is the faith. So he's saying first and foremost, instruct them in the words of the faith. The faith that saves us. And then he says, and the good doctrine. This could also be tra translated as Sound doctrine. That means to rightly teach and apply the scriptures. Anything beyond that is from the evil one. Anything the pastor uses the pulpit for that is not specifically giving instruction and exposition in God's word is from the evil one. There's nothing wrong with doing other things in the church. But when you stand up in the office of God's messenger, God's uh, proclamator, you have no right to say anything other than the word of God. Giving a TED talk about how to have a great life that isn't rooted in God's word is not a place for the pulpit. It's not the calling of a pastor. There's nothing wrong with having other things in the church. You know, a financial class on Sunday nights and extras is fine. You want to have a knitting class? You want to have a, a bike enthusiast class? You want to have life groups that do this sort of stuff? Whatever. It's fine to have Christian community and live our lives together. But when people gather together on the Lord's Day, it says that over 15 times in the New Testament that we are supposed to proclaim the law, the prophets of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what the preacher is supposed to do. So the good doctrine can also be translated sound doctrine. And like I said, that means to rightly teach and apply the scriptures. Paul also points out that Timothy is already living this out in his own life. Otherwise, he wouldn't be qualified to teach it. So what did he say? He said, put these things before the brothers, all the things he'd already told them, and you'll be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and the good doctrine that you yourself has followed. So you're living it out. You know what it means to be a godly man. You know the scriptures. Now as a pastor, teach it to other people. Paul tells him to put these things before the brothers. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says something very similar. 2 Timothy 2.14 says, Remind them of these things and charge them before God, not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some, but God's firm, firm foundation stands bearing this seal, 
The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So Paul calls out the same two false teachers in 2 Timothy that were making problems in the beginning of 1 Timothy. And what he says is, listen, you yourself need to rightly divide the word of truth and teach others to rightly divide the word of truth. There is a right and a wrong way to teach and preach the Bible. I'm not saying that we necessarily across evangelicalism agree on every tiny detail, but we must at least agree that there is a right way and there is a a right way to interpret God's word. There are not many interpretations. There is only one for each text. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not scores of applications, but when the writer wrote it to the people he was writing it to under the inspiration of the spirit, he was writing with a meaning behind it. And typically, it's not that we don't understand what the Bible's saying. We just don't want to accept it for what it is. What did he say? Paul says, teachers who are not rightly dividing the word of truth need to be corrected. And if they are unrepentant, they need to be cut out. That is what Paul had sent Timothy to do. To kick the false teachers out of the church. Because they wouldn't take correction from the word of God. Paul rebuked them by name openly. And here's why. Because he understands if he doesn't that their false teaching will lead other people into trouble and ungodliness. He actually says they're like gangrene. I've given this analogy many times, even once during this this session, but since there's new guys, I'll say it again. Paul uses the term gangrene. So obviously within the body of Christ, the very first option is not cut it out, right? Someone makes a mistake or says something wrong. The idea isn't as, well, you messed up. Cut that guy out. No, it's like cutting your hand. If I was working on something with a saw and I cut my hand, the first thought I have isn't, well, better cut my hand off. No, the very first thing is, man, I wonder if I can stitch this up and put some ointment on it and see if it will heal up, right? I'm going to try to take care of it and nurse it back to health. That's what the correction of God's word does to real Christian people. When you rebuke a false a person who's teaching falsely, but they're truly God's people, they will be able to submit to the word of God. But if they're unwilling to, they're like gangrene. It won't heal. In fact, it's going to spread into the body. And at some point, if you don't make a decision to make a cut there, it's going to seep into the rest of your body and kill you. That's not the first solution. That's the last solution. But these people had taught a false gospel. They wouldn't take the rebuke of Paul by letter. They wouldn't take the rebuke of Timothy, who was God's anointed pastor under the official um, uh, authority of the apostle. So at some point, it's we need to expel them. But even in the expulsion of them, what did he say? He said, let's turn them over to the devil for a season so that hopefully that they'll they'll fall into trial and trouble and they'll repent. The goal is restoration, but we're not going to leave cancer or gangrene in the body at the expense of the rest of the body. Verse 7, he says, Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. So the good servant and minister of Christ avoids the influence of unbiblical teaching. Now, I don't claim to be perfect here. I don't think I have all the answers, but I take the fact that I I am uh, given the the charge of responsibility of your spiritual lives very seriously. That's why I'm very picky about the books that go into the library. I'm very picky about the people that come and preach to you. Not because I'm judgmental or think I'm better, but because I have been entrusted. Listen, I'm not saying I make a perfect decision every time, but I take the responsibility of being trusted very seriously. Very seriously. I want to air. Listen, I, I want I want it to. The most important criteria for me is, is that person biblical? You guys are, are, are called to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I don't want to make you a disciple of me. I want to make you a disciple of Jesus who rightly divides the word of truth. If there's something I preach that doesn't line up with the word of God, I would hope that you would come to me and say, hey, listen, what you're saying here doesn't seem to line up with this here. Maybe I can go, yeah, here's what it means. Or maybe I could go, maybe I'm wrong. I'm not above the word. I'm subject to it as a servant of Jesus Christ. And every preacher and every church that you attend 
should have that attitude. We are all servants. We are all followers. Just the fact that I'm an under shepherd doesn't mean that I'm not uh, any less liable to the word of God. In fact, the word of God says I'm doubly is liable for the life I live and the words I teach. Paul tells Timothy to have nothing to do with false teachings, irreverent and silly myths. Listen, the church is filled with silly nonsense today. Let me tell you uh, just a little, a little nugget you can put in your pocket. Flee anything that has to do with God that is treated silly or irreverent. Joking around about texts of scripture and, you know, making some sort of television show uh, or Marvel comics. This stuff is nonsense. Jesus is my homeboy and trying to just lower God into some sort of relatable thing. And that's, that's really what most of them want to do. They want to make him relatable. They, they think that's what having a relationship with God is. Listen, we have relationship with God, but we must deem and, and respect the fact that he's holy. We shouldn't be irreverent to God. The fact that he took on flesh and died for us and became approachable to us doesn't make him any less holy. And it should make us all the more grateful. Yeah. Don't buy into any irreverent, silly myths, jokes. Don't make jokes at God's expense. Uh, listen, if you do it, I'm, I'm not saying you're going to hell. I'm saying watch your mouth. Think about it. Think about what you're saying. Think about who you're talking about. Yeah. Think about how important he is. The church is filled with silly myths that are not biblical. The Word of Faith movement is a great example of this. The idea that we elevate man over the sovereignty of God. Avoid anything that's irreverent. Anything. Anything that makes light of God. Anything that elevates man. Anything that's funny or silly uh, that people do to try to make it seem like God is like us or God is on our level. I'm not telling you you can't be funny or silly in your life. I can't, I'm not saying you shouldn't joke around with each other, just not at God's expense. He's off limits. He's something else. He's something other. There's a place in Isaiah where it says, the problem with man is they think that God is like them. God is not like us. He is holy, and the whole earth is full of his glory. Paul tells Timothy to make disciples, and to train himself for godliness. Here's a, a, just a, a, a practical thing to think about. To train others in something, you yourself have to be trained. For some reason, when it comes to biblical theology, people have it in their mind that they, they don't, you know, there's like just the Spirit of God is there and they don't have to like learn about the Bible. And all of a sudden you're like a Christian for three days and you know everything. I like to equate it to pool. Maybe you guys haven't experienced this, but it's been my experience that it seems like every red-blooded man thinks he knows how to play pool, even if he's never played. That's why it's so easy to hustle someone on a pool table if you know how to play pool. Like every person thinks he's good at pool. I haven't picked up a pool cue in 10 years, and I've probably played 18 times in my life. Yeah, let's play for 20 bucks. Maybe that's not a good example. Maybe if you didn't grow up around a pool hall, you, you, you can't relate to what I'm saying. But the point is, is it's not about being like better than someone. It's the idea that if you can't know these things and walk them out to some degree yourself, what business do you have teaching it to other people? This isn't like lowering you or saying, you know, that someone is less than Paul. That's why Paul said, don't don't let a novice be a pastor. Not only does he not know what he's doing, but you're, you're pushing him into a place where pride might destroy him. And that's not to his benefit. To be a teacher, you have to be a student first. Amen. Before you can teach calculus, you have to learn addition. Before you can teach people to read and write, you've got to learn your alphabet. And there's no shame in it. But we should, we should expect this of people who, who teach and preach. The word of God. To train others, you must be trained yourself. We need teachers of the word who are not themselves um, or who, who we do not need teachers of the word who are not themselves serious about the word and serious students of the word. Dedicated students of the word. Here's something all Christians should consider. 
Your desire to be learned in God's word should be greater than your desire to teach God's word. That goes for me too. That goes especially for me. My desire to learn and be a student of this word should be much greater than my desire to teach the word of God to you. In fact, in my careful preparation of sermons, there's never a time where I sit down and I don't learn something new or have an expanded knowledge of something. As my, my knowledge of God and my knowledge of the scriptures grows and grows and grows over years and decades. Remember, we don't study theology to become puffed up. We study theology in the scripture to know God, to rightly know God. Many people say, I don't want to know about theology or doctrine. All that stuff bogs me down. I just want to have a relationship with Jesus. But you can't rightfully worship something that you don't rightfully know. And that's what the word of God tells us. It tells us how God wants to be worshipped. It tells us what is pleasing to him and what is not. What is praiseworthy and what's abominable. What is sin and what is not. What is right and what is wrong. Who is God and who are we? We learn all of these things from the scripture. Don't be deceived by men who seem allergic to the word doctrine. That old fashioned word. I don't, I don't, you know, we just, we kind of take it easy at our church. We don't want to get too bogged down in doctrine. Let me tell you the truth, brothers. All men have a doctrine. The only question is, is that doctrine rooted in the scripture or in them? All men have a doctrine. All men have a code. All men have a system of beliefs. Even the atheist has a religion. Everybody believes something and lives by something. Everybody is religious. Everybody has a way they live and what they believe. The question is, is it rooted in something eternal and sure? Or is it rooted in the flawed failure of a fragile, broken, finite man's mind? Verse 7. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. And into verse 8 he says, For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So here in my version, the ESV, it uses the word train. To train in godliness. But in the New American Standard, it uses the word discipline, which is translated from the Greek word gymnazo. Gymnazo is the word from which we get words like gymnastics and gymnasium. Every Greek city had a gymnasium, and many people then, like today, were very dedicated to training and disciplining their bodies (coughs) to make them strong, attractive, and healthy. Paul says that while there is some value in this, it is immensely more important to train yourself in godliness and in sound doctrine because it has more value in this life and value eternally. And so Paul uses an allusion here to something he talks about um, in other books of the Bible. But he, he, he doesn't take for granted that in Grecian culture that this is the birthplace of the Olympics. In Olympia is the, is the birthplace of the Olympics. A similar version of this was born in Athens in a, in a place called the Pantheatic Games in the Athens Stadium. And this is the sort of origins of the Olympic Games. And just like today, the athletes for these events would train year-round for these events. They would, they would eat a certain way, they would diet, they would exercise, and they would spend all sorts of time training so that they could win their event. I mean, you think about, in our context, how much effort some 13-year-old girl puts into uh, being a gymnast to doing all those flips or doing the, the work that they do on the bars. They don't just, like, get up there and do it. They get up at, like, 5 o'clock every morning. They eat a very strict diet. They jog. They do whatever the coach tells them to. And they train year-round just so that they can do two or three events in the hopes that they'll go to the Olympics and possibly maybe get a gold or a silver medal. 
Paul, in, in his day, they didn't receive gold, silver, and bronze medals. They got crowns that were made out of leaves, and they were, they were plated in gold, wreaths. And you still see when they show the Olympic Games that symbol, symbolism of the, the sort of Grecian crown. And Paul says, listen, while the world strives for a corruptible crown, we strive for an incorruptible crown that will never perish. And so he's saying, listen, yes, there is some value to, to training your body a little in comparison to the eternal benefit of training yourself in godliness and in sound doctrine. The word godliness is really opposite in many ways of the word translated before that, that comes to irreverent. They're actually sort of opposites. So godliness having to do with holiness, sacredness, having to do with honor and the way in which we live honorable, sacred lives towards God. Anything that devalues or undermines that, anything that undermines and devalues the sacred and holy nature of God is irreverent. So the idea of being old-fashioned, you know, well, you shouldn't talk that way in church and you shouldn't do this. Sometimes we try to disassociate the idea of liturgical Christianity from reverence. Do you know what I mean? Liturgical meaning there is a sort of uh, older Protestantism where there's a lot of rituals and symbolism. You light candles and you sit down and you stand up and you wear a robe and you walk through the, you know, there's a bunch of things you do. I don't have any problem with that as long as, as long as you're doing it in the right spirit. But there's people that are saying, hey, we, don't, we want to get rid of all that traditionalism. But what they're really saying is, let's get rid of the reverence we have to God. So you don't have to light candles or do any of that stuff. But when you come before a holy God, you better treat him like he's holy. And here's what I want to say. Those who really know God will. And how do we know God? From his word. I may have told this story before, but in the, in the Old Testament, there is a period of time where the Philistines had taken the Ark of the Covenant from the Jews in a, in a battle. And because they had this sacred Ark, it was causing them all sorts of trouble. And so at some point, they said, we need to just give it back to them. Because this is it, all sorts of trouble was befalling them. And they knew it was because they had the Holy Ark, the mercy seat of God, as the Ark of Covenant was, was called. And the Ark of the Covenant was meant to be transferred and to move in a certain manner. There was only one segment of a particular tribe that was allowed to even carry it. And when they carried the Ark of the Covenant, they were trained to carry it on poles. And they were supposed to walk certain uh, certain uh, distance back from it. And they would carefully carry it because anyone who touched the Ark would die. And so when, when the Ark got sent to the Philistines and the Philistines sent it back, they had built a little cart for it. And they put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart. And that Ark was being um, brought back to Israel on this cart. And so when the Israelites went and got it, because they were excited, and they probably thought, man, this cart works a lot better than carrying it on the poles do. God had prescribed them in the book of Leviticus how to carry the Ark. They said how long the poles are supposed to be, what people were supposed to carry it. There was very strict instruction. And God said, this is how I want to be worshipped. This is how I want to be honored in this situation. But instead of doing that, they left it on the cart. And one of the guys who wasn't part of the right tribe, wasn't trained in the right way, when they were pushing the cart along, it hit a, a rough spot on the ground. And the ark shook. And he reached his hand to steady the ark, had good intentions, and he was struck dead. People look at that scripture and they say, man, that ain't fair. That ain't nice. He, was, he had good intentions. But the Christian says, God is holy. God is holy. God, Listen, if God wasn't holy, then Jesus died for nothing. God is holy. Not because he wants to be, but because he is. And we cannot treat something so beautiful and marvelous as God in an irreverent manner. Being spiritually fit means to reverence God and his word and to take these things very seriously. Like I said before, like a gymnast who must be in peak physical shape to do their event. 
And as a teacher of God's word, he's saying, listen, not only should you be in peak physical condition, but you should rightly instruct those so that they can be in peak physical condition spiritually. Verse 9, he says, the saying here is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. So this is referring back to what he said in verses 7 and 8. This isn't talking towards verse 10. What he's saying here is a sort of axiom, an axiom like a saying, a Greek saying, that says Christians should believe this and apply this to their lives because what he just said is a trustworthy and true saying. <clears throat> verse 10, it says, For to this end we toil and strive because we have a hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. So Paul uses the example of working out like a disciplined athlete for two reasons. One, he wants to show the life-altering and extreme dedication that it takes to follow God. And the eternal implications of the fact that it matters more than anything. The dedication we must have for God the dedication we must have for his word, the dedication we must have for the gospel, which leads to eternal life. So how much more dedicated should the person administering these things be? Now I want you to understand something about strive and toil. When he says we must strive and toil, we remember that we are not striving and toiling from a place of trying to be accepted by God. We are striving and toiling from a place of acceptance by God. We don't strive and toil hoping that God will accept us. No, through Christ, we've been accepted. Amen. And we strive and toil for his word and for his, for, to make his name famous and to live holy lives and to be sanctified and to lead others towards God. Not because we're trying to earn anything from God, but because we love God and we know he first loved us. So sometimes you hear preachers go to one extreme on the other or the other. They go, listen, no, no, no. Don't strive and toil. Just rest. Yes, rest in your salvation. You don't have to earn your salvation. But in your salvation, work. Work and toil and strive. It's not a contradiction. One thing has nothing to do with the other. Salvation is a free, unearned gift of God. And because we understand and perceive the value of that gift, we live our whole lives towards him as a living sacrifice. We must strive and, and toil and study in prayer, in holiness, in our witness, in our proclamation of the gospel, in standing for truth, in living for the truth. But like I said before, we don't strive to be accepted by God. We strive because we have been accepted by God. We do it out of love and obedience towards God and towards the lives that we hope our lives impact. We listen. We are, if you're really a Christian, you are a slave of Christ and you are a servant of men. Your life is completely in subjection and obedience to Christ. That's what it means. You can't call him Savior if you don't call him Lord. If, he, if you are not bought with the price, if you are not bought with his precious blood, if you don't belong to him, then you have no part with him. The idea that you are a slave to the master shouldn't repulse you. That's, that's the problem with all people in all places in life who don't want to follow Christ. It's because they want to be the Lord of their own life. We want the benefits of God without obedience to God. But here's the truth. He's a better master over your life than you ever could be. He's a better master over your life than you ever could be. He knows everything. See, we err on our view of God in two distinct ways. Some people struggle with the idea of the greatness of God. We wonder if God really created the world and if God's all-powerful. We, we wonder if God can. And other people struggle on the other side of the equation. They believe God's great and all-powerful, but they wonder deep down if God is really good. Does God really care about us? Is God really working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose? Both things are true. God is great and God is good. <clears throat> so we strive and toil to live godly lives and to teach others how to live godly lives because 
he tells us, because our hope is set on the living God. We serve a living God, not a philosophical concept, not a philosophy, not a myth, not a story, not a God who came and died and didn't rise. We serve a living God, a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is eternal, but we're talking more specifically about Christ. He's saying, listen, we serve a living God. The book of Romans tells us because he laid his own life down and took his own life up, he has mastery over death. And so he is qualified and able to offer eternal life to us. We strive and toil to live godly lives and to teach others to live godly lives because our hope is set on the living God. We serve a living God, but more specifically, Paul is referring to the head of the church himself, Christ, who rose from the dead, proving that he alone is the Savior of the world. The last part of that verse says, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe? Which means that there is only one Savior, potentially. The Bible makes it clear in many other places that the only people who are saved are those who are in Christ. This isn't like a text for universalism, like everybody's going to be saved. What it's saying here, sort of in a, a, a sort of backwards way in English, but really in Greek, it's making it very clear that there is only one potential Savior. He's the Savior of all people. There isn't like a different savior for other cultures or a different savior for a, a different period in history or a different savior, uh, you know, that's different than Jesus. He's the savior of all people, potentially, but especially towards those who believe. Technically, he only saves those and actually he only saves those who believe. <clears throat> Acts 4.11 says... This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which now has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no name under heaven given among which men may be saved. 1 John 2.2 2 says, He is the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And then, of course, Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a positive statement. The negative is also true. There is wrath and condemnation for those who are outside of Christ. Really, up until this point in the book of Romans, that's what he's been building towards, is the fact that there's wrath and judgment for all people outside of Christ. 1 Thessalonians says, All things outside of Christ are subject to judgment and wrath. In Christ, though, there is no condemnation. There's only one name by which men are saved. And the apostles understood this. They lived for it and they died for it. And Paul the apostle is passing this on to the next generation of pastors, Timothy. And this is the tradition and, and method of, of of the pastorate from the very beginning. Jesus is the only possible savior for everyone in the world. This is why we must strive and toil to preach the gospel because outside of him, there is no hope of salvation. And since all scripture points to, explains and works out this truth that Jesus is the savior of the world, we must strive and toil to preach sound doctrine regarding every part of the word of Scripture. Because it is not going to... Um, we, we can't distort other parts without distorting the gospel. The entire Bible is about Jesus. It's like a movie. If there's a hero in the story, the fact that he isn't in the first scene doesn't mean the movie's not about him. At some point, it becomes clear who the villain is and who the hero is and who the, the helper is and who the damsel is. Jesus is the hero of the story. The Bible is about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all things were made through him that has been made. 
In him was life and light, and that light shines in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. From the beginning of creation, Jesus was there. Everything about the Old Testament shows us how desperately we needed a Savior. The book of Judges showed us that people did what was right in their own eyes. We needed a better judge. We had to kill sacrifices for the remission of sin every single year. We needed a better sacrifice. Even the best king, King David, killed someone and committed adultery. We needed a better king. The prophets were rejected by the people and killed off. We needed a permanent and eternal prophet. And Jesus fills those roles. Prophet, priest, and king. And so we must boldly proclaim the entirety of Scripture. Man, if there's something else you guys don't get here, the greatest road to apostasy is this. I believe in Jesus and stuff, but I don't really believe this part here. Don't really care for this part here. If you can't take God's word about that, you can't take his word about anything. And a subtle deconstruction always ends up in total apostasy. Always. Haven't you seen any of these people deconstructing these famous pastors who left the faith? It didn't start one day when they said, I don't believe in Jesus. It started one day when they said, is that really a sin? And here's the truth. Most people who are lenient towards certain sins is because it it looks like someone they love, or more often than not, it looks like something looking at them in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand that Christianity is not about being who you are, or being your best self. It's about being born again. Mm -hmm. It's about being born again. It's about being changed from who you thought you were into who you really are. Mm So in a bold and very straightforward way, Paul says in verse 11, you must command and teach these things. This isn't a suggestion. This isn't merely a wise saying. It is a command given under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. John MacArthur would say Paul's command to Timothy contrasts sharply with much of contemporary preaching. Preaching in our day is often intriguing, but seldom commanding. Often entertaining, but seldom convicting. Often popular, but seldom powerful. Often interesting, but less often transformative. Command and teach these things with authority. He said that these are the commandments that must be taught. And we must teach sound doctrine. The sound doctrine of God's word with what? Authority and power. Because we're doing it on behalf of God, not be on behalf of ourselves. <clears throat> I've heard people say, what you're saying behind the pulpit is judgmental. Let it be judgmental. I'm not the judge. I'm the humble messenger. And any good pastor or preacher or evangelist is merely delivering a message on behalf of a king. The question is, do I fear you or do I fear the king who sent me? Brothers, you better believe I don't fear you. And I don't fear this world. I fear the Lord. I fear and reverence the Lord. I love the Lord. I want to do His work. And here's the other thing. I love you. My words can't save you. Me cutting out the parts of the Bible you might not like can't save you. Only thing that can free you and save you is the truth. To reject any part of God's word is to fully reject Christ. Christ is the Word. I didn't say to to not understand part of God's Word. I didn't say to be misunderstood about a part of God's Word. That would disqualify everybody. I'm saying to, to reject a part of God's Word is to fully reject Christ because He is the living Word. The good servant of Christ is bold in preaching and the commandments of God. He confronts sin, unbelief, disobedience, and anything that attempts to contradict, minimize, or stand opposed to the scripture. And all this is done out of love. <clears throat> Titus 1.9 says he must hold firm to the trustworthy word is taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Verse 12, 
Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So we've discussed that a good pastor and servant of Christ must warn his people of error. He must be an expert student of the scripture. He must avoid being influenced by compromised and unholy teaching. He must discipline himself personally to live a life of godliness. He must be hardworking and committed as a pastor and a teacher, and that he must teach God's word with authority, not his own authority, God's authority. It's the prophetic utterance. When the prophets come to the king of Israel and says, repent, he's saying, thus saith the Lord. And every pastor who preaches is preaching with a prophetic utterance. If in fact, he's rightly preaching the word of God. Because if you rightly preach the word of God, you, you have the authority of heaven behind you. You have the power of God behind you. Paul will now give Timothy the single greatest ingredient and tool in Christian leadership. One that will increase the value of all the other things he's listed. And this is to live out an exemplary life of virtue. Paul tells him he must do this in his speech, in his conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. <clears throat> then, just like today, though, it is often hard to gain respect when you're younger. And that's why he starts with this. Don't let them despise you because you're youth. The fact that he was a younger man physically didn't mean that he was a novice. In fact, Timothy or Paul talks in other places that, that Timothy had been living for God from a very young age. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.5 says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and then in your mother Eunice. And now I am sure dwells in you as well. 2 Timothy 3.14 says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So just because Timothy was a young man doesn't mean he was young in faith. <clears throat> and so sometimes you're going to be advised by men maybe younger than you who spiritually are older than you. And Paul's saying, listen, the qualifications have nothing to do with how old you are, Timothy. It's the fact that a prophetic word was spoke over you. The elders conferred on you and, and, and ordained you as a minister. I have witnessed your faithful living before God and your understanding of the scriptures. Thomas Brooks, a, a famous Puritan writer, said, Example is the most powerful of rhetorics. Example is the most powerful of rhetorics. So let's look at the, the few character attributes of virtue that, that Paul told Timothy to model for his congregation. One was speech. A man of God must avoid all untruth in his speech. Yes, he must, he must have a yes that is yes and a no that is no. A godly man also must avoid angry speech, impure speech, slanderous speech. His speech must be good for edification and to fill the need of the moment and to be graceful towards those who hear it. Now, I want to tell you something. Many of you have been conditioned to believe that grace means telling you something you like. No, grace has to do with the gospel. Grace has to do with telling you the truth in a loving way. Grace doesn't mean, well, I'm just going to show him a little grace, so I'm not going to confront him in his sin. It's not what grace is. Grace is the opportunity to repent. And without confrontation of sin, there is no opportunity to repent. It's not very graceful. Ephesians 4.25 says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, 
Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Down in verse 29, it says, Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only, what it, only such which is good for building up, as it is fit for the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And then verse 30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of, rede- of, of redemption. <clears throat> so this is an admonition for the Christian man, but, but Paul is saying how much more so for the pastor. Here's the truth about the words of, of the pastor. The way you spend your words away from the pulpit will have an impact on how, how powerful your words are behind the pulpit. The way you spend your words in life I'm not saying you never mess up. You guys have played basketball with me. (laughs) Some of you. But the truth is this. If all the rest of my life is just empty words and I don't keep my word and I just babble and say things that are half true and untrue and then I'm angry and I'm unloving in every other area of my life, when I get up here and boldly preach God's word, what is it going to sound like? It's going to sound like a loud gong or a clanging cymbal in your ear. He's saying, listen, set an example with your speech. Number two, set an example for the people with your conduct. A good minister must model righteous living and manifest biblical convictions in every area of their life. Pastors must remember that people, more often than not, they shouldn't, but people under your care, more often than not, will follow the way you live than the things you say. Show me a pastor that has some unrighteous dealings in a place in his life, and people in the congregation know about it. It's going to set the bar really low in that area. I've even known pastors, you know, believe it or not, who have mistresses that people in the congregation know about. There's churches like this. The most important thing we can do, and listen, not just pastors, ministers, men who speak God's word. All of us are supposed to speak God's word. We're supposed to be salt and light. The way you conduct yourself has a great impact on the value and power of your words. Mm. Your life can devalue, can destroy, completely obliterate any words you say to anyone. Mm -hmm. That's why some of you right now have a hard time are relating with your family because you desperately want them to believe you. But your life has completely bankrupted your words. Don't be nervous. Don't be sad. You can build it back. Living a life here for a year where you do right is going gonna, is gonna to actually give some credence to your words. Maybe two years from now, the next time someone calls you on something, you say, no, that's not the truth. You can believe me. They might go, okay. Not like, what? I need to make a few phone calls first. Conduct brings value to your words in the Christian man's life, but so much more for the preacher. Number three, love. A biblical minister (laughs) must do everything in the spirit of love. Now, we define love by the word of God, not how the world does. Love is not an emotion. Love is not giving in. Love is not letting someone uh, persist in sin. Love is not divorced from the truth. Biblical love is sacrificial and consecrated and desperately concerned about your eternal soul above all else. I love you first and foremost with the gospel, brothers. What I want for you more than anything is to find Christ and be saved from the penalty of your sins. Everything else is just icing on the cake. If you get everything you want here, if you left here sober with a high paying job, all your relationships fixed, a bank full of money, a big house, a fancy car, all of these things, but you didn't have Christ in your heart. If you weren't a servant of Christ, then all of, all of my work here was for nothing. Nothing else matters. In fact, I'm, I'm actually very terrified for that person because now he don't have a, a reason to turn back to God. My prayer is that God will derail him or detour him somehow that he sees his desperate need for God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat>
Listen, <coughs> biblical love is sacrificial. It's self-denying, but it's never truth-denying. Real love is doing what's right for someone no matter what it costs you. That's good. Pleading with someone. Telling someone the truth when they don't want to hear it. When they spit in your face. When they take you for granted. When they lie to your face. Love is doing what's right for someone because you actually care about what happens to them. Number four is faith. Now in this context, it's talking about being faithful, not belief in the Christian faith. So basically saying be a person who sets an example of faithfulness. Be trustworthy, be loyal. This has a lot to do with being a faithful Christian. And then finally, five is purity. This speaks uh, pretty specifically to sexual immorality of any kind. And also not being tainted by the lust of this world. It's a very hard thing to do. Because there is reasons and avenues and portals for lust everywhere. I got one in my pocket right now. It's an iPhone 12. All kinds of lust of the eyes and the flesh are there. You can drive around and see billboards. Listen, you've got to do your, your best to stay pure. It's not going to happen by accident. Most people who fall into some sort of sexual sin didn't set out to do it. They just weren't very careful with their life. I'm talking about Christians, not non-Christians. Christians who fall into sexual sin just kind of thought that they were just going to live for God and, and, it, and nothing was coming for them. It's coming for you. It's there. The devil is roaming to and fro to seek who he might devour. And nothing will ruin your Christian witness more than this. There's many men in this room right now who are dead set on never picking up a meth pipe or a bottle of whiskey ever again. But when you leave this place, you probably shack up with a girl that you are attracted to because she's a good girl that quick. And it's just as damning for your soul. We talk a lot about immorality in our world, the celebration of immorality and homosexuality. But we don't even hardly talk much about fornication. It's so normal today. There's churches that would let you be a leader at the church if you're living in sin with your girlfriend. Do you realize homosexuality and fornication are right next to each other and those who will not inherit the kingdom of heaven? And listen, will God forgive you? Yes, of course he will if you fall into sin. But the wrecking effect it has on your life and your soul is so damaging. And if you're a Christian minister who falls into sexual sin, not only are you wrecking your life and the girl's life or the guy's life, but you're wrecking many other people's lives. Stay pure. That's why earlier in the text he said, a pastor must be a one woman kind of man who is faithful to his wife, who lives a life that is above reproach. It doesn't mean just not doing wrong. It means you're far, far away from even the appearance of doing wrong. Verse 13, we're getting close to the end, brothers. <clears throat> he says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. This is really an ex exhortation to Timothy and all who are pastors to build their ministries around faithful, public biblical teaching and preaching true biblical preaching involves reading the scripture giving exposition and teaching teaching in context with exhortation which means it's calling the hearer to respond that's what the exhortation is it means that as i preach and proclaim god's word and rightly divide the word of truth i challenge you to apply it to your life, calling for the hearer of the word to also be an obedient doer of the word. Exhortation challenges the congregation to apply the truth of God's word in obedience to their lives. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Exhortation may take the form of rebuke. It may take the form of encouragement. It may take the form of warning. It may take the form of counsel. It may take the form of comfort. The word exhort actually means to bind truth to your conscience. 
Don't you know that's what preaching really is? It's taking truth and trying to help you bind it to your conscience. Truth that is bound to your conscience is a truth that you will live out. The reason we don't care about God's word and we ignore it in our daily lives is because it is not bound to our conscience. We are not men of conviction. Men of conviction will live for the word. Men of conviction will die for the word. This is an extreme Christianity. This is Christianity 101. That's what it means to be a disciple. You can't, there's no such thing as a person who becomes a Christian who is not a disciple. People go, what about the thief on the cross? I promise you, if he would have came down off that cross, he would have served Jesus just like all the other disciples. He had faith that he was sitting next to God. It shows that it's not about works. But he wouldn't have just said, I'm going to go back to being a thief. Nice talk, Jesus. I'll see you later. No, being a disciple is about following Jesus. And those who are truly regenerated and made alive in Christ desire to follow Jesus. And we know how to do that through the word of God. <clears throat> All true preaching, and I know there's some preaching that you, you've heard and your flesh loves. You love it. It's exciting and fun. But all true preaching must include teaching. Now, you can teach without preaching, but you can't preach without teaching. What's the difference between preaching and teaching? Well, Martin Lloyd-Jones would say this. If you have to ask that question, you've never heard preaching before. You can teach something without preaching. I could get out a Greek book and say, turn with me to this. Here's what this word means. Here's what this means. Preaching is, is taking truth in the spirit of God, making it come alive to the hearer, binding it to your conscience. That's what biblical preaching is. It's proclaiming the word of God, giving exposition and exaltation of it, applying it to your lives. If that doesn't describe the preaching at the place where you go to church, then find somewhere else to go to church. If it's not centered around the word of God, it doesn't matter the cadence of the man's voice or if he talks quiet or if he talks loud or if he has a big pulpit or if he has a little pulpit or if the sermon's 30 minutes or it's an hour. Or in your guys' case, like an hour and 15 minutes. True preaching must include teaching. You can teach without preaching, but you cannot preach without teaching. If you hear preaching that doesn't include exposition of Scripture, that is soundly and clearly taught and carefully and rightly applied, this is not preaching. Paul tells us what it is. Do this until I return. This is your job to hold fast to sound doctrine and give instruction in it and rebuke those who contradict it. And here's the truth, brother. The flesh longs for things of the flesh. We long for things of the world. But the true Christian in an ever increasing way will hunger and thirst for the word of the Lord like a deer pants for the water. Verse 14, do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. So the Greek verb, emelio, is translated as three English words. It means do not neglect. This is an imperative. Imperative, you know, language is made up of imperatives and indicatives. An imperative is a verb. It's something you do. Something you're being called to do. Something you're being called not to do. And in this case, it's negative. A negative imperative. It's saying, do not neglect the gift you have. And in, in Timothy's case, that is the gift of pastoring and preaching and teaching God's word. It's an imperative commanding Timothy and all people called to preach and teach not to neglect the gift of pastoring, preaching, and teaching that the Spirit of God has equipped him with in service of Christ and for the benefit of the body in which they serve, which the prophetic utterance confirmed by the council of elders. So Timothy was called to be a pastor through what? Prophetic utterance. This doesn't mean that he heard an audible voice from the Lord like Paul did. It means the same thing it means for most pastors. Pastors. 
The voice of the Lord, Lord through internal promptings and awareness came to Timothy. And because of this calling in his life, he decided to set his life apart as consecrated and to study and to serve. And eventually a group of elders or pastors saw this calling in him. They saw his godly life. They saw he was apt to teach and they ordained him. Now this may sound subjective. Like so men decide who, who the preachers No, Timothy was called. And other pastors validated that in him. There's another place where, where Paul is telling Timothy that it is his desire to fan the flame inside of him. <clears throat> Timothy had consecrated his life and submitted himself to the biblical qualifications of an elder. Timothy submitted himself and studied the scripture under the authority of elders, which he was under, and at some point through prayer and observing Timothy's ability to teach his life and his character, they validated the calling of God on his life and ordained him. Paul is saying to Timothy, don't forget that God called you to be a pastor. And other godly men recognized this and nurtured in you. So don't quit. Don't give up. Listen, your gift is in service of Christ and in service of the body of Christ. This is who you are. And here's the truth, brothers. All of us have a place in the body of Christ. And you have to function where God has set you. Listen, you may not be a pastor, but all of you are called to be members and ministers of Christ. There's someone's voice that, that's going to hear your voice that ain't going to hear mine. Listen, this is where the, the saints gather together. And I, we, we, we become encouraged and rebuked and correct and, and instructed in sound doctrine so we can go out and win the world. Someone needs to hear from you. Someone needs to hear the gospel proclaimed from you. Someone standing next to you on the pipeline needs to hear the truth of Scripture from you. But they also need to see a life that backs it up undeniably. That's good. They need to see Christian character. Yeah. They need to see a person who's faithful. They need to see a person who's yes is yes and no is no. He's saying, Timothy, you're called by God. Don't quit. Don't give up. Although you find yourself in a very difficult situation. Verse 15, he says, practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. The true man and woman of God, but especially the pastor, must be single-minded and devoted with all-consuming devotion to their calling. The man of God doesn't get a day off from being godly. Yeah, I get a day off from preaching, but, but I don't get a day off from being godly, and neither do you. Life isn't compartmentalized. Like, we're not going to church this week. Hey, we're going to vacation out of town. I'm going to party a little bit. The true Christian says, I'm going to vacation somewhere. I wonder if God will put someone in my path. Here's the only way you're ever going to really live a life for God, brothers, is becoming aware and fearing and loving God. Who you end up being after you leave this place, when there's no Pastor Josh around, there's no consequences immediately. <laughs> the only way you're going to have successful um, a successful Christian life is to be transformed and to be conformed to the image of Christ. It's all, it's what's going to have to happen. Salvation is a miracle of God. But if you're a Christian, you've got to work at letting yourself be sanctified. You've got to attend church. You've got to subject yourself to biblical teaching. You've got to be a student of God's word. Listen, you've got to sharpen yourself. You've got to be able to know God's word. So when you hear false teaching, not that you're critical, you're just saying, that just doesn't really add up. Nothing, and not in a critical way, nothing makes me happier than when a student sends me a sermon and he says, I listen to this and it just doesn't seem biblical. And I'll go, well, because it's not. Listen, it's not about being judgmental. It's about being vigilant. Listen, we are at war. Yep. And we are at war with people who we want to win over. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's a different servant sermon. We must be immersed as followers of Christ, students of his word. And as pastors, we must do this transparently so people can see our progress. This isn't speaking of being uh, boasting or doing things for the approval of man. It's talking about being humble and transparent as Christians and especially as Christian leaders. A Christian leader that, that don't want you to know 
how they spend their time, what they do. Secrecy is not the friend of, a, of the Christian. It doesn't mean everything is everybody's business. There are some things that are secret. I have an intimate relationship with my wife that's between us. There are things that happen in my home that's not bad, but it's, it's really nobody's business. But my life should be transparent. If you just happen to stumble in my house at any given moment, I shouldn't be ashamed. I'm not saying we're, we're it's, it does say progress. It doesn't say perfection. There are no perfect Christians. But we can't set the bar so low in our life that we go, nobody's perfect. Is that what the Olympic athlete does? Hey, you know, I can't even do the, the cartwheel, but no one's perfect. No, I can't do the cartwheel, so I'm not leaving the gym. I can't land whatever that flippy thing they do on the pole is. And I'm not going anywhere until I do. And there's a coach saying, just position your arm a little differently. Listen, this is the job of preachers. This is the job of anyone who gives instruction. That's why it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that we must correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. If you've heard this analogy before, bear with me. I'm almost done. But if I was coaching Little League Baseball and, and my, my, little, my Little League guy was standing over the plate, here's the plate, and, and he goes, you know, I wouldn't go, that a boy, Timmy. Great job. It's not time for encouragement. You know what it's time for? Correction. No, no, no. Take a step back off the plate. Pull your elbow up. Put the bat level with your head. Step into the swing. Keep your eye on the ball. This is correction. And when he's trying to do it, if he falls back into his old habits, I rebuke him. No, no, no. Keep your elbow up. Keep your eye on the ball. But hit or miss. If his stance is right, his eyes on the ball, and he's swinging, hitting or missing, if he's doing it the right way, I'm going to encourage him. Come on. Yes, you can do it. Keep at it. Correct, rebuke, encourage in that order. This is biblical instruction. This is the job of a pastor. Encouragement without correction and, and rebuke is deception. And it's not love. It's cowardice. <laughs> The calling of God as an elder pastor is an all-consuming calling, and it must consume your life. You are to live as a slave to Christ and to his teaching, and you should be a servant to others as you teach and help them to do the same. Here's the final verse. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. I just want you to think about this. Timothy is the pastor over pastors in the city of Ephesus. He's like the head guy. And Paul doesn't take for granted that he too could be deceived. Keep watch over yourself. Keep watch over your life. Keep watch over the doctrine you teach. Be careful. Be vigilant. What does he say? Persist in this. His final exhortation to Timothy is this. Keep a close watch on yourself and your teaching so that you don't drift into heresy and compromise and stay vigilant, uncompromised in your life so that you don't lead others into false teaching or compromise either. <clears throat> Persist in your faithfulness to the word of God in, 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 in your teaching and in your instruction of others, but mainly and mostly and first and foremost in your own life. And those who hear your teachings will find salvation and they will find sanctification and they will find growth and they will find correction and rebuke and encouragement and mutual affection and comfort because their lives depend on it. And so do yours. Verse 16 is the most important part and often the most neglected of pastoral ministry. Keep a close watch on yourself. Now, some of you, that's the end, some of you in here are going to be ministers, like official ministers. Some of you are going to pastor church. Maybe there's a few of you in here. Some of you might be a youth pastor. Some of you might be an elder. Some of you might be a deacon. Some of you might be a missionary. Some of you might be an evangelist. Colby, you thought you were going to be preaching sermons three years ago? Definitely not. <laughs> Listen, God is calling you to something.
But even if none of those things I say describe what God's calling you to, God is calling all of you to be ministers, lay ministers of the gospel. He's calling you to live as salt and light and to preach the word of truth. And to preach the word of truth, you have to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. And most importantly, you have to live it out before others. God, I pray that you would give us the grace and the peace and the strength to not only hear and perceive your word, but to rightly apply it to our lives. Lord, bind your truth to our consciences. Lord, that we wouldn't be haughty or arrogant or that we wouldn't be stiff-necked and uncorrectable. God, that our greatest goal in life would to be to be like you, to be conformed to your image. Lord, to be uh, charitable and kind and loving. Lord, so that we can model this gospel. Lord, let us be bold and uncompromised in the truth of your word. Let us be keep kind and meek and loving and graceful in our administration of it. Lord, we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.